Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Yesterday in this very city, we had a protest of sorts. We had a bunch of neo-Nazis and Ku Klux Klaners and others combine under the label of Unite the Right. It was their goal to create, recreate, I guess, what they did in Charlottesville a year ago when they had hundreds of people there confronted by thousands of counter protesters. And they had so much anger and division and violence that, well, an innocent young woman was murdered, Heather Heyer, by neo-Nazi. A black man was beaten up into a pulp and um, two police officers actually died in a helicopter crash. It was, as it were, I guess the high moment for the movement that they call the alt-right, that I just call neo-Nazis. Well, they came back yesterday and about 30 people showed up. The hardest thing was keeping those 30 neo-Nazis safe, I guess, from the thousands of counter-protesters uh, that reacted to those 30. And it raises the question, what do we do about it? Who are these people? Does it matter? A whole bunch of questions immediately come to the fore. Should we just ignore them? 30 people, 30 pathetic right-wing losers who believe in a kind of virulent racism, open virulent racism that, well, few people will show up in, and particularly in a place like Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, where they know that they're vastly outnumbered. Now, they were vastly outnumbered in Charlottesville as well, but Charlottesville is a blue island in a red sea. The nation's capital, obviously, um, is even less less uh, welcoming of racism than, than Charlottesville. Well, if we ignore these right-wing jerks, are we kind of papering over the problem? To me, the 30 or so pathetic losers that were there really represent probably, I don't know, 100,000 each in relation to the real virulent racism that still exists in the United States, but doesn't show its ugly head in a very, very open way. Very few people will come and march for hate, but that doesn't mean they don't practice it. They don't practice it in who they employ and who they associate with and what they think of people sitting next to them on a bus or a train and to how they treat people who are different from them. After all, if Trump support is 30 to 40 percent, that includes a heck of a lot of racists. I'm not quite sure ignoring them is the right way to go. Overwhelm them with a counter protest. Well, Okay, that seemed to work in Washington yesterday. It certainly worked in Boston a year ago or so when I forget, 25 or so alt-right jerks were surrounded by 25,000 proud liberals confronting them. Still, it's a lot of effort to go after a relatively small number of difficult people. And then I was reading about who these people are, their leader. Jason Kessler is his name, uh, and reading a Facebook post by a former friend of his, or maybe I should say acquaintance of his, someone who knew him in school, someone who felt sorry for him because he was a guy who was struggling with his own demons, you know, could never get a date, had no friends, was lonely, wasn't particularly right-wing or racist 10 years ago, actually supported some liberal causes, but did not find sympathy, support, brotherhood in any place but among the neo-Nazis. But thinking a lot about white identity, what it is, if it's anything, and what it means, and why more people are coming to accept it or embrace it. At local high school, in the area of Virginia that I represent, Alexandria, Virginia, where I'm a, a 
state representative, a delegate in the Virginia House of Delegates. There was in high school um, originally sort of a celebration of diversity. And um, there was a, a sign, you know, we are black, we are Latino, we're gay. And someone put up the sign, we are white. And then everyone was asked to take their signs down. And then there was no discussion about it. Now, I agree that we are white is offensive in a way that we are black is not. But I want to explore this hour why that is. How can that be? Why you can't and shouldn't take pride in being white any more than you should take pride in being straight. Full disclosure, I'm a gay man. People do have to take pride in things. It's important for people to feel self-esteem and love and support, whatever your background. And indeed, movements like the civil rights movement for blacks or immigrant rights movements or movements that praise Asian or Latino cultures or gay culture, for that matter, women's rights movement, right? Women's rights movement shouldn't offend people. But the men's rights movement, I think, should make us feel a little distasteful. Why? What's the difference? Well, the obvious first difference is that one is a movement of traditionally unempowered groups, and one is a movement of traditionally empowered groups, right? There is such a thing as white privilege, whether white people recognize it or not. You do get an advantage for being white when you apply for a job. But what is white? What does it even mean? Growing up as a kid, I, as a Jewish kid, I, I never thought of myself as white. There's even a book, by the way, of when the Jews became white. Apparently Jews became white around the 50s or 60s. Prior to that, we were definitely considered other, non-white, Middle Eastern, different. Believe it or not, the Irish, and the Germans didn't used to be white. And by saying white, I mean the generally accepted power and privilege. Right in the 1840s, when mass immigration from Ireland and Germany came to the United States of America, the US was largely an English country, English and African, the Africans being largely enslaved in slavery. But yeah, there were signs, right? No Irish need apply here. There was anti-German sentiment. It's kind of ironic given that the plurality of Americans today are of German heritage. Did you know that? If you add up everyone's heritage in the United States, no, plural, no single heritage reaches more than 20%. Think about that when you're thinking about what America is. But the highest, the plurality of Americans, 20% or so, come from German heritage. The second highest, about 18%, come from English and then there's, well, everything. There's Italian, there's Irish, there's French, there's African, there's Chinese, there's um, Latino, uh, which really should be broken down. I don't know why, you know, I mean, there's Mexican, there's South American, there's Spanish. And African-American, we lump all that together, but should we? If you go to Africa, people in South Africa are very different from people in West Africa. And certainly the people of North Africa, they're not even really considered black. They're considered Arabs, which apparently is white, particularly when you think of the fact that they're from the Middle East and the Caucasus, remember Caucasians? Caucasus is a Middle Eastern place. It's actually in Iran now. So Iran is white and English isn't, and maybe it's Indo-Europeans. Do you know where the term Aryan comes from? Do you know? The Nazi term Aryan comes from Indo-European languages. It used to be called Indo-Aryan languages. as to distinguish them from Semitic languages, like those Hebrew and Arabic languages, which were considered inferior. By the way, Finno-Ugric, Finno-Ugaritic is also not Aryan. You know who's Finno-Ugaritic? Hungarians and Finns. And you know who is Indo-Aryan, according to this linguistic definition? Yes, the English and the Germans, but also Indians, people from India. Sanskrit is an Indo-European language. 
So according to the Nazis' term of what whiteness is, people from India are white, and people from Finland are not. Confused yet? Maybe you're confused because none of this makes any sense. And it doesn't. Race is a construct. Racism is absolutely a construct. The Nazis base their, the base their theories on linguistic theories, which make no sense because I'm pretty sure that there are black people who speak English and there are white people who speak Sanskrit and there are Latino people who can speak Chinese. Really, the color of your skin does not affect what languages you can learn or know. So what are we to do with all this information? Again, the Nazis made up some funky ratio linguistic theory to make basically their hatred of Jews have a little bit of scientific and premature, right? We hate Jews. We hate Jews because the Semites are a separate people from the Aryans because Hebrew came from a different root than Indian and English and German, or for that matter, Hungarian and Finnish, or for that matter, Chinese languages. I don't ask you to make it make sense because it doesn't. Once we understand that racism and race is a complete construct, it helps us back into the question of how we're to approach identity politics. So racism is a construct. Scientifically, it means nothing. Um, even the difference between male and female is not that great, but no question the difference between the races is much, much less than the difference, but the biological differences between the genders, right? I mean, our blood types, have more biological meaning, O and A and AB, than, than our skin color, scientifically race is meaningless. But historically, race is everything. Martin Luther King talked about a colorblind society. And that would be great except for hundreds and thousands of years of history. And when blacks say you can't ignore who blacks are now, you can't pretend that we have a colorblind society, they have a point. Race may only be a construct, but it is indeed the original sin of the United States. It was largely because white people thought they were superior. I shouldn't say white, I should say Europeans, because I haven't really defined white yet. We'll get to that. But Europeans thought that they were superior to the Native American cultures who'd lived here for thousands and thousands of years, that they could justify massacring them all, committing the original genocide. It is the original birth of the United States before we even got to slavery. This stuff is complicated. And I'll explain more when we get back. 888 mark 888 I'll be right back right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. So hello, Facebook audience. Hope you find this show interesting today. We're going to mixture, mixture. <laughs> Got to speak correct English. I'll be, I'll be accused of not being white. <clears throat> uh, we're going to mix uh, history, psychology, philosophy today, sociology. There's a lot of sociology in what I'm about to talk about. Understanding how minds work. So there's some, what's the word here? Um, I'm not a scientist, but we are going to look at how brains work today. So lots and lots to talk about kind of my riff off the protest yesterday, but also toward how we get past all this. How we celebrate our diversity and also celebrate being together as Americans at the same time, not one instead of the other, but both and. Anyway, stay tuned. If you want to call in, please do. We'll be back in about two minutes. Maybe I've studied a little too much Nazi race theory. That's <laughs> just so convoluted. <sighs> Hey, Mark, just double check any of your G-chat up. Oh, 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 let me do that right now. Sorry. No worries. 
came in a little late, couldn't park in my normal spot. That always throws me off. Made it just in time. By the way, if you're listening on Facebook Live, and I see many of you are now, um, and you're enjoying the show, please share it. Um, if you put it on your Facebook wall, people can listen live right now. And um, even if they don't listen live, they can watch the archive later. So if you've enjoyed what I have to say and you think it's informative, please share it. Let people know that we do this. Um, I Obviously, the more – if you agree with me, then please help magnify my voice. And if you're listening on the progressive, well, actually, progressive voices, people can't listen right now to what I'm saying on Facebook. So I'll tell them live. But yeah, tell your friends and family about the show, please. Ooh, nice find, Mark. Yeah, I will. I will get there. We're having a show, by the way, Wednesday, not Thursday this week. Um, so note that, and we'll be on Wednesday at three Eastern time. We'll be back shortly. And now, the voice of reason in an Ready, Mark. unreasonable Ready. Here you world. Go. Mark Levine. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about racism today, but in a kind of a different way. I want to talk about where we go from here. So I've talked about the past. I've talked about we have a long, long history of racism from uh, particularly in America, from genocide of the Native Americans to slavery of African Americans. We have mistreatment of other groups, mistreatment of immigrants, mistreatment of Latinos, mistreatment even at one time of the Irish and Germans, definitely mistreatment of women. Did you know that women, married women, couldn't own property until the 20th century? That's why Scarlett O'Hara doesn't remarry in Gone with the Wind. Married women were property of their husbands not to mention children. We had religious discrimination, uh, certainly discrimination against Jews. Also today, religious discrimination against Muslims, discrimination against atheists, people who don't believe in God. We had Catholic discrimination, major Catholic discrimination in the United States. That's why it was a huge deal that John F. Kennedy could win the election. We've had so much discrimination in our history that the vast majority of us include a group that's been discriminated against, right? I mean, most of us are either black or Latino or Asian or Jewish or Catholic or non-Protestant Christian or we're women or we're gay or lesbian, bisexual, transgender. We may be non-immigrants. We may be of German heritage or Irish heritage or Italian heritage or French heritage or Canadian heritage, or Mexican heritage, all of which have been discriminated against. Well, the white, male, straight, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant Christians who came over as descendants of people from the Mayflower stand up. You don't count either. You know why? Because your ancestors were Puritans, and they were discriminated against too. We came to this country, our ancestors, either because we were enslaved and brought over by boats, or because we were fleeing something ourselves. My great-grandparents were fleeing anti-Semitic persecution by Cossacks in the area that's now Belarus. I'm sure you have a similar story in your family. 
once you understand that we are the refuse of the world who has proudly grown up and become the most powerful, most diverse, richest country on earth, you understand that this is essential to our heritage. This is who we are as Americans. We're all refuse of some kind or another, but refuse that made good where the part the world threw away and went off and showed ourselves to be better than the places we came from. What does all this have to do with white identity as distinct from black identity or Latino identity or Asian identity or Jewish identity, male identity, female identity? What are you supposed to think if you're part of the overgroup and not the undergroup? How do you take pride in your heritage, which everyone has a right to take, and yet at the same time, not put down someone's else, someone else's heritage. We're going to get to that in the second half hour, but I'll give you a quick clue. The goal is to celebrate yours without excluding others. And we'll get to how to do that right after the break. If you want to call in 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275, back after this. My name is Mira Batra. I have... This topic's been burning inside me all weekend. I really uh, like the beginning too, how you explained a lot of the roots. You know, I, I've studied the history of uh, how the Nazis used propaganda, and I only learned some of some of the roots you're discussing. And yeah, it came from it, linguistics. It, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's so they also tried to use um, pseudo scientific things. They would do cranium measurements oh, the where they would try they to prove that uh, the, the, they, they couldn't prove the white people's brains were bigger. So they would prove that the angle and shape of the head or the skull, uh, there's, there's a whole racist, I forget what it's called. It's crazy. Cro Crognograph, whatever, where they would measure, you know, uh, they would look at noses because if your nose were too big, then you're Jewish. And therefore, you're. I mean, they looked at everything to try to divide us up and to say that we're, you know, different from one another in some meaningful way um and uh yeah they tried to make science out of it but really the rift today began when someone was telling me what would happen in this alexandra high school and it made me think why is it wrong to say we are white on the walls and it is but why and that's the question i'm sort of struggling to answer today but i think i have i think i have an answer It also relates back, and I'm going to get to this, about Laura. In fact, get Laura Ingram's statement, the one about demographic changes or that we didn't want. You know, you know what I'm talking about, Mark? He's probably on the other line talking to a caller. Hey, Mark, you there? Hey, Mark, yes. Okay, um, so two things. One, I'd like you to pull up Laura Ingram's uh, oh, famous yes. insult where she talked about demographic changes that we didn't want. Yes. Uh, her racist comment. It's only about like 20 seconds or so. And then I also want you to go to my webpage, marklevingtalk.com, and go to, to the video, uh, which is down below. Uh, just click the first video. It's the one with me and Corey Stewart. And go to 354. And there, Laura Ingram said something quite similar to me when I was on her show. And I'm going to call it. for those two clips. Let me know when they're both ready. Okay, well.
Yeah, Julian, the word wasn't eugenics. There's a word for, and it's completely not a science, but they, the Nazis measured the cranium. It's like craniography. All right, ready, Mark? Ready. I'll let you know. When Just let me know when, when, the, when those two right. clips are ready. All right, here you go. I'm ready. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking today about white identity. What the heck is that? Why should people fear not just white supremacists like the 30 losers that protested in Washington, D.C. yesterday, but why should people cringe rightfully when people start talking about white pride, whereas they have no problem and shouldn't have problem with black pride? Black lives matter, not a problem. White lives matter, we have an issue. Gay pride, no problem. Straight pride, got to be concerned. Women's rights, of course. Men's rights, what? Why? Why is that wrong? Let's start with white. What does white mean? It's a weird word. Is there such a thing as a white people? Let's start with the fact, is there such thing as a black people? I mean, the Africans that were brought to these shores came from all over Africa, mostly from West Africa, but really from all over. Nobody really makes a distinction between whether the blacks in this country came from East Africa or South Africa or West Africa or the Caribbean after being many years there. African Americans lost their native have culture, clips. lost their tribes, lost their heritage when they were brought in the Great Middle Passage to slavery. So what did they have in common? Well, they had in common their skin color. They had in common some Pan-African traditions, and they largely made their own culture in the United States of America, right? Jazz isn't African. Jazz is African-American. Jazz is a combination of, you know, the old spirituals, right? They are presumably have some melodies from Africa, but combined with America and, and um, it, it, African-American culture came here from here. It's, it is American culture. And so blacks did form their own people and identity and culture right here in the United States. What about Asians? Well, go to Asia. There's a massive difference between Chinese and Korean and Japanese, even among the Chinese, there's vast differences among the billion people, billion plus people that inhabit the Chinese mainland. Heck, South Korea and North Korea are fighting each other. Different cuisine. They, they, are, they would consider themselves very different. But here in America, with a predominantly non-Asian culture, Asian Americans get lumped together. Same with Latinos, right? Massive difference between someone from El Salvador and someone from Cuba and someone from Argentina, and someone from Brazil, and someone from Spain. Vast differences, vast differences in heritage, in culture, in language, in the foods they eat. But, and Mexico, I didn't even mention Mexico. They all come together here in a melting pot. And they will tell you Chicano is one thing and, and Chilean is another thing, but in America, right, the white, dominant white culture lumps them all together, Latinos. And so in that cauldron of majority white privilege, we push minorities into specific identities. You know, what about Arabs? Well, there's a vast majority differences among the Arab world. Jews, are Jews white? Like I said, Jews really weren't considered white till maybe 50 years ago. They are generally considered white now. What does white mean? Were Catholics white? Not originally. Germans, Irish, not originally. We're not even white. Actually, I'm darker than most white people, but even most white people aren't particularly white. White is defined as the group in power. White is defined as the majority group, right? White is defined as just English at the beginning, and then come the Irish, and then come the Germans, and then come other Catholics, and then the Italians. And then Jews, maybe Arabs, not sure. Latinos are often white in this weird construct we have. If you're from Spain, are you white? 
The reason it's confusing is there is no definition. We use these words all the time. We don't know what they mean. And that's why white power is very dangerous and very different from black power. When you have a group that's traditionally discriminated against and they rise up to demand equality, as blacks have done, as gay people have done, as women have done, they have to bond together as a group. They have to demand equal rights. But when a group that has more power than another demands more power for the already overprivileged group, what exactly do they want? More privilege? More power? More right to dominate people who are already less than? I want you to think about that, right? If you've got a mismatch, right? You've got a mismatch in, um, oh, I'm trying to think of a sport that has handicaps. I guess golf has handicaps, so I don't really play golfer. So you've got this pro golfer and this uh, 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 amateur golfer, and you give a handicap, right? You give so many strokes. I hate this example because I, I can't think of another sport that has handicaps. Um, the point is, is that you might give a few points to the person that's behind to make them equal. But you're not, if you give more points to the person who's ahead, that just makes them further ahead. So if you're advocating for equality, you're going to support the underdog. But once you start supporting the overdog, you're actually supporting more inequality. But what does this mean for the white kid, right? I mean, Johnny wants to have pride as well. He sees there's black pride. He sees there's gay pride. He's a straight white male kid. He sees there's pride for girls, special programs, you know, to get girls to be proud because they're traditionally not getting equal wages, not getting um, as much representation in, in legislature. Well, are straight white males evil? No, of course not. They've traditionally had more power in America. Johnny may not have that power. Johnny may come from a broken family. Johnny may come from a family where his dad's in jail and his mom got fired from the factory. Johnny may have a dad who's an alcoholic. Johnny may have trouble in school. Johnny may have dyslexia. Johnny may have mental illness. Johnny may grow up poor. None of these things are his fault. Can't Johnny be proud of who he is? Of course he can, and he should be. But the pride is not in being white. You should really never take pride in being overpowerful and to be part of a group that has systemically made life harder for other people. There's really not much to take pride in being the overdog. But Johnny can be proud in other things. He can be proud if uh, he's the first kid in his family that goes to college. He can be proud if he's learned a new skill and he won the championship at something or another. And if he wants to be proud of his heritage, study his heritage. Maybe he's of Irish heritage. There's a proud history there or Italian heritage. Maybe he's of English heritage. And he wants to go back and see that his family's from Scotland. You know, we have a Scottish parade every year in Alexandria because a Scotsman, uh, John Alexander, founded Alexandria. That's where he got the name. Didn't come from Egypt. And you know what? No one complains about that. Why should they? I proudly march in the Scottish parade. I have no that I know of Scots blood in me. But Scotsmen is not a threat. Even if Scots people are largely white, male, are they Protestant? I think they're Protestant. Maybe they're, no, they're, they're Protestant. Uh, white, male Protestants, that they're not a threat because they're celebrating their Scotch heritage, not their overlord heritage. And that's really what white means. We don't need straight pride parades because 90% of people are straight and there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities for straight people, much fewer for gay people and even fewer for trans people, right? We don't have a cease gender day where you celebrate the fact that you proudly inhabit the sexual uh, identification that you were born with, right? I'm a guy. I have a guy's body. I like it that way. I don't take pride in that. I'm, I'm glad. I don't have that issue. I don't have a problem. I don't, I, it, it, it's not difficult for me. I was born in the body I wanted. That's good. But if you weren't, I don't have to, I don't have to have a march about it. We can take pride in our heritage. White people out there, you can be proud of your heritage. I, I don't have a problem with ancestry.com. 
you want to find out that you're part Hungarian and, and part Chinese, go for it. But don't take pride in being white because there's nothing really proud about whiteness. I think even the expression white is not, I don't know how common it is. I think it's become more common as we've had comics and all we have black people, comics who obviously tell their story and in doing so kind of make fun of white people and, and really frankly, very gentle ways. And so I think there's been a backlash of people claiming their white identity. There is no real white identity though. So go celebrate your identity as an American if you want to go back to your ancestors and celebrate your identity as Czech or Swiss or Finnish, go for it. But when you start talking about white power, now you're talking about something that is about oppression because white power leads to oppression. So I think that's why not too many people are marching with the alt-right today, but that doesn't mean that a lot of people aren't racist. That doesn't mean a lot of people aren't thinking racist thoughts. Look, we should reach out to people who are lonely, people who have few friends, people who are mentally ill, like this guy who led the parade, apparently has this long history of nervousness, right? We should reach out as human beings to one another. We should allow people to take pride in who they are. But the pride is never, the only reason why we need people to take pride in traditionally groups that have been discriminated against is to show the black kid that, yeah, a black can, man can be president of the United States. And yeah, uh, we can have uh, fantastic black scientists and leaders, of course, because white people might try to pretend those don't exist. The same is true for a kid that grows up gay or trans. I mean, when my colleague Danica Rome, one is the first transgender state legislator in the country, trans people all across America cheered her on. Not because she was better than any of us, although she's pretty damn good, but because it showed that we all have a role to play in this great diverse country of ours. So how do we dampen down racism? How do we celebrate diversity? And what are we to do with these pathetic people who are still very dangerous? Don't ever doubt that just because someone is pathetic someone's a loser, someone's a white nationalist, that doesn't mean that they're not dangerous. You can have a dog that's been beaten up and that poor, horrible dog has been beaten. It's terrible what's happened to them. But that dog could be snarling and angry and could still bite you and because it'll hurt you hard. Not because the dog cho chose that. Don't doubt that losers can be dangerous. Most of the Nazis were losers and they became very very dangerous. And they're being whipped up by a lot of people on the right. When we come back, I want to play a couple clips from a Fox News host, Laura Ingram. Uh, one that very famous, just came out last week that a lot of people are talking about, and one that she said to no acclaim to me on the Fox News set. And talk about why that mindset is so dangerous and what we can do about it. If you want to call in 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. Rumor has it he quotes the Constitution in his sleep. Is it super nerd? No, it's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Yeah, physiognomy. That's a, that's a good word, Julian. Oh, the word I was looking for, I found it, is phrenology. Phrenology is a pseudo-medicine, according to Wikipedia, phrenology is a pseudo-medicine primarily focused on the measurement of the human skull. They measured the human skull to try to prove that people were smarter one or another. Uh, you're talking about physiognomy, which is also a pseudoscience based on your looks. And God, humans are constantly trying to divide us up and uh, 
Oh, there, you found it, Roy. I'm sorry. We both found it. Um, Roy, you had it. I didn't look where you found it, though. I, I, uh, I looked it up. But you're absolutely right, Roy. It's phrenology. Um, physiognomy. So I'm reading the clips right now. I apologize, Marty, and to everyone of Scott of Scott heritage. As scotch is a drink, a person born in Scotland is a Scot. So it should be Scott heritage. Apologize to uh, my Scots out there. <laughs> so the Scots were Catholic. I thought the Scots were partly Protestant. Yeah, no, I guess the Scots were Catholic, but then the Northern Irish were Protestants. The Catholics of Scotland are about 20% of the population. Okay, all right. See, I learned stuff from my, from my uh, listeners as well. That's kind of all my point. We're all descended of some disfavored group or another, so why can't we all celebrate each other <laughs> and our differences? Mm. Ingram's daughter is an immigrant from Guatemala. Oh my God. Wow. So she adopted her when she was three in 2008. The girl's 13 now. Wonder what her own daughter thinks of her own mother. I'm sure she's embarrassed. Wow. Thank you, listeners. You teach me so much. And by the way, again, please spread. Um, if you like this show, share it on Facebook. Just just send a notice to all your friends. Send them a message. Um, really trying to expand the show. And uh, I was encouraged to do this by our friends at Progressive Voices. So please uh, spread the word if you like the show. And um, even if they can't listen live, they can still hear the archive show. So. We'll be back shortly. Mark, we're going to play the infamous Laura Ingram clip first. And then okay, gonna, I'll have that ready first. And, and then, then we're going to play yeah. the clip with me shortly thereafter. Got it. And I didn't tell you where to end that one, so I'll probably just start talking and just cut it off when I do. Okay, I'll be ready. Who says nerds can't be fun? It's Mark Levine. Here you go, Mark. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. Yeah, who says nerds can't be fun? I'm nerding out actually today on race and history and psychology. The people who marched in Washington yesterday had a very, very small following, um, laughably small following, but their close cousins on Fox News have a very large and scarily large following, and that includes Fox News host Laura Ingram. Laura Ingram said to millions of people on her show just, I guess, a week ago, well, she said this. Parts of the country, it does seem like the America that we know and love doesn't exist anymore. Massive demographic changes have been foisted upon the American people. And they're changes that none of us ever voted for and most of us don't like. From Virginia to California, we see stark examples of how radically, in some ways, the country has changed. Now, much of this is related to both illegal and in some cases, legal immigration that, of course, progressives love. Okay, stop right there. Stop right there. Now, the America we know and love, who's the we, uh, is upset by changes foisted upon us. Who's us? Who did the foisting? Their demographic changes. 
that people from Virginia to California don't like, which people don't like those changes, Laura. And it's not just illegal, but it's also legal immigrants. Does that include your three-year-old adopted daughter from Guatemala who probably hates her mom right now? What is this foisting? What are you talking about? America's been a country of immigrants for 350 years, since long before we were a country. Actually, we're going to have our 400th anniversary in Virginia uh, coming up. What you talking about, Laura? Is there any non-racist way to think about what she just said? And this isn't some new crazy thing that Laura is saying. She said something similar to me just a few months ago when I was on the set with her and Corey Stewart, the racist guy running for, for senator from Virginia. Let's play that clip. I, I know a lot of I know a lot of of my fellow Virginians who are afraid. They're living. The law does places. nothing. You they're that? they're li they're living in places like Sterling, uh, which used to be a kind of a rural community. They're living out in Manassas. They're living in Alexandria, where you represent, and they don't even recognize the communities in which they live because there's more criminality. There, uh, there is, uh, there's less of a feeling of cohesiveness in Not the community. Uh, I Look, disagree. Long, I, mean, I, I, probably lived, I probably lived here just as long as you, if not longer. And I find the attitude that, well, they don't commit as much crime. First of all, well, I don't care if all one right, let's American just stop. Let's die. just stop it. So she's afraid in Virginia because her cities aren't looking like they used to look. They used to be rural and now they're cities. Okay. The process of us going from rural to city began, I don't know, in the 1700s. Um, are you afraid of New York City, Laura? Because that's where you broadcast out of. So is it city life that you're afraid of? She said they don't look like they used to. What do you mean by look? Is it the buildings you're afraid of or the people who live there? She actually slandered my city, Alexandria. I said, not true in Alexandria. We welcome diversity in Alexandria. And you know what they do in Sterling too? At least good people who recognize that that's what America is all about welcome our diversity. What do they mean by demographic changes? Let's be blunt. In about 20, 25 years, America will no longer be a majority white country. I celebrate that. Because white is a construct. It has no meaning. And I don't like white privilege or white supremacy. I think people should do well based on their merit. Be judged, as Martin Luther King said, by the content of their character rather than by the color of their skin. If our plurality is German and it's only 20%, that means 80% of us are not from Germany, 82% of us are not from, from England, and the numbers just increase after that. We're a big mix of the world. We are the world. That is what makes America great. That is always what made America great. It's not about being white unless you're a racist, Laura. And yet somehow she was afraid to embrace that term, maybe because she knew if she did embrace that term, she'd be kicked off the air. But if you are concerned about the demographic changes in America, the question is why? We still have parades celebrating Scots culture. We will still have parades celebrating Puerto Rican culture and gay culture and Latino culture and African American culture and French, British, you name it. The differences are not exclusive. If I want to march the St. Patrick's Day parade, I do. And we have one in Alexandria. And I do. And I don't have any Irish blood in me and I wear green, and I'm welcome, and I even drink some green beer. It's bringing Irish heritage to all of us to celebrate. But blacks can't march in the Klan parade. That kind of white identity is defined as being exclusive. Whereas America is at its best when we take our wonderful cultural mix and celebrate everything in it. I can go to the sauna, I can listen to jazz, and I can finish with a Chinese meal. That's the America I know and love. This is Mark Levine signing off.
You're listening to the Progressive Voices Network, and here's a clip from Tarabon. Great show, Mark. That was fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, been I felt like I was in it all weekend. I, I felt like I was back in college with a great professor. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate it. My pleasure. All right. Well, I will talk 